Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. When they came to Marah, they could not drink the water of Marah because it was bitter. Therefore, it was named Marah, and the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? And he cried to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a log, and he threw it into the water, and the water became sweet. There the Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them, saying, if you will diligently listen to the voice of the Lord your God, and do that which is right in his eyes, and give ears to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord, your healer. Then they came to Elam, where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Amen. This is God's word to us this evening. Well, let's pray as we come to God's Word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be pleasing in your sight. Heavenly Father, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, some of you are probably too young to remember this, and... um, I'm going to be 40 soon, so I'm going to have to get used to saying that. But uh, in the 1990s, there was uh, one character on TV who was what we could call the personification of grumpiness. And the show was One Foot in the Grave, and his name was Victor Meldrew. Uh, I'm not going to do his voice, but he had a catchphrase. Uh, Lots of you will know it. "I, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. And the name Victor Meldrew, Victor, his name was ironic because Victor was a man who was, well, he seemed to be constantly defeated by life. And everything always seemed to go wrong, and animals and children and next-door neighbors, uh, everybody seemed to, to cause him endless frustration. Well, in these verses, God's people are, are, they're a bit like Victor Meldrew, they're grumbling, And while you and I often think of grumbling as uh, something funny, uh, the Bible makes really clear it's serious. And actually in Exodus, in uh, the end of chapter 15, and in chapter 16, and in chapter 17, we are going to hear a lot of grumbling. Uh, The Bible takes it really seriously. C.S. Lewis uh, once put it like this. He said, hell begins with a grumbling mood. Hell begins with a grumbling mood. And tonight we need to face up to uh, grumbling. And as we look at this, as we look at these verses, verses 22 to 27, what I want to do is I want to look at them under three headings. And the three headings, they're really three places. And here's the first heading, here's the first place. It's a place of need, a place of need. Well, it's the start of a new year, and it's uh, been a few weeks since we've been in Exodus, and so what we need to do, I guess, is situate ourselves, and if you can remember, the first 14, first 15 chapters of Exodus, they're all about how God gets his people out of Egypt, and it's a story full of drama, and it includes all kinds of events, doesn't it? Moses' rescue as a baby, his meeting with God at the burning bush. Uh, God's confrontation with Pharaoh, all the plagues, the Passover, the escape, the crossing. Uh, A friend of mine was preaching on uh, Exodus. He preached on um, chapters 1 to 18, and he called it The Great Escape. And The Great Escape is a great film, and The Great Escape is a great title. And in chapter 15, God's people have just sung. They've just sung a great song, haven't they? They've just been reveling in God's amazing rescue. I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he's thrown into the sea. 
But then everything seems to change. Look at verse 22. Then Moses made Israel set out from the Red Sea, and they went into the wilderness of Shur. They went three days in the wilderness and found no water. Now, uh, someone in our house, Jonathan, is starting to love Bear Grylls. And he's starting to love Bear Grylls' uh, kids' books. And if Bear Grylls was here tonight, he would talk to us about the rule of threes. And the rule of threes is this. Apparently, if you, uh, in terms of sort of surviving, you can survive three minutes without air. So don't, don't try it, okay? Three minutes without air, three hours in extreme heat or extreme cold, three weeks without food, apparently, three days without water. And so in other words, in verse 22, God's people, they're right at the limit, aren't they? Um, It's 72 hours, and they're very close to death. And in many ways, water is so basic, isn't it? We just take it for granted. Here I have got water here. But having just been saved through water... God's people are now scrambling around. They're trying to find water, aren't they? In desperation, it grows. And just remember that this was God's covenant people. They would have had children with them. They would have had elderly people with them. And I think, so this incident, what it teaches is something really important about being a believer. It teaches us this. Here's a principle. Great, after great deliverance, there's often great difficulties. After great deliverance, there's often great difficulties. And we see this, don't we? Chapter 15, verses 1 to 21, it's it's a mountaintop experience, isn't it? God's people are on top of the world. God's people are finally free. God's enemies have been crushed. And then there's great difficulty. And this is so often what it's like as a Christian, isn't it? So someone's converted, maybe she's converted at, I don't know, like CU Events Week or something like that. And all of a sudden she feels like her whole life has changed. All of a sudden it's like she was living in a black and white world, now she's in a a technicolor world. And all of a sudden she's got this wonderful relationship with Jesus. She's met all these Christians. They all seem so lovely. And she thinks, well, I've never felt like this before. I've never been so happy. And then a few months later, she she struggles in her course, or she gets a diagnosis, or someone she loves does, or she just starts to feel very surprised that that sin that she struggled with, it sort of, it seems kind of unbeatable. After great deliverance, often comes great difficulty. And the Christian life, it's a life of highs, isn't it? And yet it's also a life of great lows. It's a pilgrimage. It's a battle. It's a fight. It is a struggle. And you and I, we need to remember that. There is false teaching around, isn't there, that would tell us otherwise. And we need to reject it. So in a sense, what we have here, it's a picture of the Christian's experience. And yet, I think it also has something to say to the person who's not yet a believer. One of the ways that the Bible speaks so often about life without God is to use this idea of thirst. And so Isaiah says, come all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. The Bible ends in a similar way, doesn't it? In the book of Revelation, what do we read? Let the one who is thirsty come. Come. And I think it's a really poignant illustration. So many people go through life, they are, they are thirsty. And they've got all the water they, they, they want to drink, don't they? But they're spiritually thirsty. Uh, deep down, they have a longing, don't they? That, that nothing in this life seems to fully satisfy. And for so many people we, you and I meet, there is an emptiness. They might seem very confident They might seem to have everything, and yet they feel this spiritual thirst. And to be a Christian is to be able to point to the one who satisfies. It's to be able to say to somebody, 
I've noticed. I've noticed that you feel restless. I remember what that was like. I want to tell you who's helped me. Jesus says to the women at the well, whoever drinks the water I give them will never thirst. And so what we see here, we, we see in sure a place of need, a place of need. But that's not all we see. In verses 23 to 26, we see in Mara, we see a place of testing. A place of need. Secondly, a place of testing. Now, it's often said, isn't it, that um, actions speak much louder than words. And I think that's really true, isn't it? And yet it's also the case that our reactions often speak a lot louder, don't they? How you and I react, well, that often says so much. And in verse 23, God's people react. They finally find water, and yet we're told they can't drink it because it's bitter. And look how they respond. They give the place a name. They, like, rename it. And you can see that. They call it Mara, the Hebrew word bitter. And this is not the first time in Exodus that there's been talk of bitterness. Back in chapter 1, the Egyptians, they made the lives of God's people very bitter. In chapter 12, they eat the Passover meal with bitter herbs. And they do that to remind them of their slavery. And so this, this water, this bitterness, this, this must have felt like a bit of a flashback. And so they complained, don't they? They grumbled against Moses, verse 24. The people grumbled against Moses saying, what shall we drink? Now, uh, people who preach are always thinking about their next sermon. Uh, and last Sunday evening, I was chatting to Kieran Kelleher about this passage and uh, at the end of the service. And uh, Kieran, if you don't know him, he's a minister in Montrose. And he, he said something I found really helpful. He said, he said, there's a difference in the Bible between groaning and grumbling. There's a difference in the Bible between groaning and grumbling. And I said I'd quote him tonight. Okay, so there we go. Grumbling is not the same as lamenting. Grumbling is not the same as a believer calling out sin or making a legitimate complaint. God's no to grumbling. It doesn't mean we say yes to becoming a doormat. It doesn't mean we, we never push back against something another Christian or another Christian leader says. It does not mean we keep our mouth shut. Grumbling does not mean we never ask questions. And grumbling is not the same as wrestling with God or begging God to change a really difficult situation. But grumbling against other people, grumbling against God is really serious. I mentioned reactions. Moses' reaction, I think it's a really good one. Look what he does. He doesn't moan back at the people. No, instead he, he, he's, he's despised, he, he's rejected, he's just like Jesus. And yet, just like Jesus in Hebrews 5, he cries out to God. And that's the right response, isn't it? If we're, if we're unfairly criticized, bring it to God. Leave it with God. Wait for God. And the answer comes in the middle of the verse. Bitter water is made sweet. But maybe tonight uh, you have sympathy for the Israelites. Maybe you think if I was in their shoes, uh, I would probably have done the same thing. Maybe we would have. But what we need to remember is they're not commended for this. Uh, we also need to remember the deliverance they just experienced. If God could part the sea, well, God could provide water. God was testing them. Uh, God sometimes does this, doesn't he? God sometimes puts his children, his uh, followers, in situations that are challenging. God sometimes uh, does it to strengthen their faith. 
Does it to help them mature? And some of you are in that situation tonight. The big word for that process is sanctification. And parents do this kind of thing all the time, don't they? So do teachers. If you, as a teacher, if you only ever make every lesson easy, if there is never anything really difficult in it, well, then the pupils learn nothing, don't they? But if you push them, if you stretch them, well, that's when they start to grow. God was doing something like that here. God had called his son Israel out of Egypt, and God wanted to see Israel grow to maturity. And so he tested Israel. He tested them. He wanted to see who are they going to trust. See, it's really striking, isn't it? They, they don't actually ask God to provide them with water. They've just experienced so much of his goodness, so much of his help, and their first instinct when trouble comes, they're so like us, isn't it, there, is not to ask him for help, but to complain. Now Jude, a little uh, letter of Jude, says this, Listen to this. I want to remind you, Jude says, although you once fully knew it, that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, that's interesting, isn't it? Jesus did it, apparently, says Jude. Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterwards destroyed those who did not believe. That's frightening. Jude says there are people who are a threat to the church. In his letter, he talks about shepherds who feed only themselves. He says people like that are grumblers, fault finders. He says they boast about themselves, they flatter others. In other words, all this stuff is really serious. And God wanted his people to avoid this. Look at the end of verse 25. They're in Mara, in the place of bitterness. The Lord made for them a statute and a rule, and there he tested them. And look what God calls them to do in verse 26. Instead of grumbling, God wants them to listen. God wants them to obey. That's a very, very different posture, isn't it? And it comes with a promise. If you do this, I will put none of the diseases on you that I put on the Egyptians. I am the Lord, your healer. Now, I don't really want to give away the end of the story, but the sad fact is that ultimately God's people refused this, didn't they? And the Apostle Paul speaks about this. In 1 Corinthians 10, he gives the church in Corinth, he gives them a history lesson, which is always a good idea. And he says this, I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. So he's talking about all this, this, these people who, 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 were, who, who escaped Egypt. And yet, as he goes on to say, almost all of them behaved in a way that was not pleasing to the Lord. And they were judged. And then he says this, these things occurred as examples to us. They were written down as warnings to us. Now, as I said, this book, Exodus, is going to hit us over the head a few times in the next few weeks talking about grumbling. And I think it's, it's good to think about this, isn't it? Grumbling, well, it's so easy to do, isn't it? But grumbling is really deadly. Listen to C.S. Lewis again. This is really striking. He says, hell begins with a grumbling mood, always complaining, always blaming others. He says, you may even criticize it in yourself and wish you could stop it. But there may come a day when you can no longer. Then there'll be no you left to criticize the mood or even to enjoy it. We love to grumble, don't we, sometimes? But just the grumble itself... Lewis says, just the grumble itself going on forever like a machine. See, grumbling can take you somewhere. 
Grumbling can take you to hell. And if God is testing you this evening, if God is challenging you about grumbling, well, rejoice. Because God is treating you like one of his own. And this passage, it calls us not to let bitterness, not to let grumbling get a hold of us. So three places, a place of need, a place of testing. There's a third place, a place of abundance, a place of abundance. Uh, in the final verse of this uh, chapter, verse 27, um, this, this verse, it reminds us that God is a God of reversals. Then they came to Elam where there were 12 springs of water and 70 palm trees, and they encamped there by the water. Now, when I was uh, preparing that, uh, that verse, it reminded me of Psalm 23. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. Because here's a God who provides a spring. Uh, here's a God who provides a spring in the desert. Uh, here's a God who gives his people who are thirsty more than they could ask, more than they could imagine. It was a resting, a restful place. It was a lovely place. And we could probably read too much into the numbers, or we could probably also read too little into the numbers. Twelve and uh, seventy, they're numbers we often think about, don't we, in the Bible as kind of, uh, I don't know, like capturing perfection or, or sort of wholeness. This is, this is the perfect place for a weary people to find rest on their pilgrimage. And God is like that. God is a God who gives rest, refreshment to his people. Now, God does that in lots of different ways, doesn't he? He sometimes gives us respite in the midst of really difficult circumstances. Maybe it's a, a walk with friends. Maybe it's a, a cancelled meeting. Maybe it's a meal, little gifts from him. And you and I should thank God for those things, even when they feel small. But I think this place for, in verse 27, it, it points us ahead, doesn't it? It points to the Lord Jesus and this little paradise, it points to the rest that can only be found in him. It points to the refreshment that Jesus gives, to the water Jesus gives. It points to the fact, to the rest that he gives to all who look to him, all who turn to him. See, what does Peter say in his first letter? He says, God has given us everything we need for life and godliness. And God tonight knows our needs. God knows our physical needs. God knows our spiritual needs. He wants us to trust him for both of those things. And he is the God who's able to lead you. Uh, God is the God who can lead you through the wilderness. He's the one who went into the wilderness. He's the one who became thirsty on the cross. And he did that, didn't he? He became thirsty, so you and I might never thirst. See, what does Paul say? He says, he who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? And so tonight, friends, grumbling is a virus. Uh, grumbling can infect a church, or a marriage, or a family. But I think there's a vaccine for that virus. I think the vaccine, I think it's gratitude, isn't it? I think it's counting our blessings. I think it's thanking God at the end of the day for just one thing we're grateful for, or, or maybe taking longer, maybe taking an hour writing down everything we can think of. Now, you, you all know, uh, if you've been coming to St. Peter's for a while, you know that I love uh, American history. And uh, there's one holiday that uh, Americans have that I wish that we had. It's not Independence Day. Okay, that was a terrible idea. It's uh, Thanksgiving. It's Thanksgiving. And it's a really good practice, isn't it? And maybe you know these words. Just listen to these words from an old hymn. Now thank we all our God with hearts 
and hands and voices, who wondrous things has done in whom this world rejoices. But then the hymn writer says this, who from our mother's womb has blessed us on our way with countless gifts of love and still is ours today. So maybe tonight you're, you're not yet a Christian. Maybe you're watching at home. Maybe you've never put your trust in Jesus. Maybe you're looking for satisfaction and yet you're, you've not found it. You're looking for satisfaction in all the wrong places. Well, if that's you tonight, you're in good company. Uh, St. Augustine was a man just like that. He was the, uh, I think, he is the greatest theologian of uh, the church. And yet for much of his early life, he, he lived for pleasure. And yet he found it left him completely empty. And it was only when he turned to the one who had made him, the one who loved him, only when he came to Jesus, that his great thirst was fully satisfied. Jesus said, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. And so tonight, what God wants for you and I, he wants us to be satisfied. And it's easy for us to think of God as stingy. It's easy for us to think of God as harsh. But that's not true. Uh, That's wrong. God is generous. God is gracious. God gives and gives and gives. And God is never diminished by that giving because He is the one, He is the source of all goodness, all beauty, all love, all grace. And only He. Only he, friends, can satisfy and can satisfy you and me. And so tonight, let's thank God. Let's turn away from grumbling. And let's look to the Lord Jesus. Let's do that. Let's pray together.